Grand Theft Auto 3 was the first GTA game in a 3D open world that you could explore at your leisure, and in doing so, it carved out its own unique genre. The term GTA clone has been around almost as long as GTA itself. There have been and still are a lot of negative connotations to the term, but I don't believe that's deserved. There have been many GTA style games that have a lot of merit, even to this day. There are a lot of stinkers, obviously, but having spent a vast majority of my life playing video games in this very specific genre, I know that there have been some really well done, polished games out there that have fallen by the wayside, only to be surpassed by Grand Theft Auto. Studios and publishers around the world saw what Rockstar was doing with their games, and the success of Grand Theft Auto left the door open for similar games to try their hand at the market. Years ago, we'd have got a lot of options for open world sandbox games. Yet, the way the games industry has progressed with the introduction of games like Fortnite, it's left us with bare-bones live service titles that promise the world and barely ever deliver. And I'm not talking about Fortnite there, but... On the single-player side of things, studios and publishers have been releasing some god-awful games with poor optimization and buggy gameplay. It wasn't always like this, however, and today I'm going to be taking a closer look at the golden age of open-world games, exploring various GTA clones and asking the question, where have all the GTA clones gone? When GTA 3 first hit shelves, it was nothing short of a revolution. Liberty City, at the time, was the most alive and realistic depiction of a city in a video game. Liberty was much more than a setting, it was a character in its own right. The dark and grungy atmosphere delivers an experience that I feel has only been somewhat matched by GTA 4. It created an entire genre of 3D open world sandbox games. Ever since the initial release on PS2, it has been praised, and then praised a little more, for its innovative gameplay and, at the time, vast open world. A world that felt alive. It was only a matter of time before other studios wanted a piece of the action. GTA 3 may have been the first of its specific genre, but it wasn't the first game where you could drive around an open map in a fully modelled 3D environment. That honour goes to the Driver series. Driver is a series that has its ups and downs. Starting in 1999, it actually beat GTA 3 to the punch for a fully 3D open world driving game. So we can't exactly call it a GTA clone. In fact, Driver is popular enough that it could well have been considered the GTA of its time, selling millions of copies on both PlayStation and PC. However, its sequel, Driver 2, which released a year later in 2000, allowed you for the first time to exit your vehicle and commandeer the cars of other people. This is the first example of a game that I can remember that is similar to Grand Theft Auto. Yet all of the missions were done in vehicles, so there wasn't much of a reason to go around on foot besides acquiring another car. Driver 3 should have been the nail in the coffin for the series, by all rights. It was an incomplete buggy mess. One that really should never have seen the light of day. Do you want to know something though? As a dumb kid, I played this game all the time. I never completed it for obvious reasons, those reasons being it was pretty much impossible for me at the time. But damn, this game looked good for 2004. It had a very unique vibe, and it was ahead of its time in many different ways. Three giant cities, 156 miles of road, 35,000 unique buildings and over 70 drivable cars, all on PS2 and original Xbox. The ambition was there, and it's a shame that the game had to release in the state that it did. The game's soundtrack, which you are likely hearing now, conveyed the tone of the game perfectly. Things were not going well behind the scenes though. The game was extremely far behind in development, and Atari had already sunk a lot of money into it. So much so that the company was hemorrhaging money. This was because the higher-ups at Atari were sweating heavily over Driver's biggest competitor, Grand Theft Auto. Despite the immense success of the previous two games, Atari wanted this one to be much more. With GTA San Andreas's October 2004 release looming on the horizon, Atari wanted to get their game out before, though Reflections needed much more time, possibly going into 2005. Atari, with practically pennies to their name at this point, needed to get the game out ASAP. They ultimately asked Reflections to wrap up what they were doing and launch the game. So Driver 3 released on the 21st of June 2004. Despite being ahead of its time in many aspects such as graphics, physics, and the three incredible city maps, the release was marred by its raw and unpolished experience. One that couldn't be fixed, as the discs had already been printed and there was no game patching at this time. Driver 3 should have by all rights killed the franchise. Fortunately, Driver Parallel Lines was up next in 2006. While not being the most innovative of the games, borrowing heavily from Grand Theft Auto in many aspects, it was a finished game, and it was developed in half the time of 3. 
just two years. Being set in both 1978 and 2006 is this game's coolest aspect to me. It's set in New York City, and between the two time periods, you can really feel the change, and it's awesome. The game had a money system, a form of wanted level, with a unique level for both yourself and your car. It even had car customization, and I used to just customize as many cars as I could while Express Yourself played over the garage's radio, at least in the 70s portion. It's a pretty solid game, and you can find it on Steam for dirt cheap, so I recommend giving it a try. There's no controller support though, officially, so it's key and mouse only, though there are probably mods to fix that. With a few side games in between, which I will not mention, Driver San Francisco topped off the series with an entry that went back to its roots, removing the ability to get out of your car in favour of the shift mechanic. The game takes place in Tanner's mind as he lies in a coma. This is how they explain the ability to shift into the bodies of other drivers and use their cars. It was such a unique game, and brought Driver back in the best way. The game is generally a lot lighter than its predecessors, and Tanner is quite quippy, as are the rest of the characters. San Francisco released in 2011. Over a decade later, we're still no closer to a new driver game. Personally, I don't know where they could have gone from here. The shift mechanic was honestly a great addition, and provided some really interesting gameplay. However, if they wanted to use it in another game, they probably would have had to put Tanner in another coma, which would have been pretty dumb. Driver was such an interesting series, but with the release of GTA V in 2013, Reflections didn't really have a chance to make a driver game that competes with modern Grand Theft Auto. The series has been left dormant since 2011 and doesn't show any signs of coming back. As far as I'm aware, Ubisoft still has the license, but they don't seem too interested in the IP. For a series that started way ahead of Grand Theft Auto, then tried to turn into Grand Theft Auto, and then eventually did its own thing with great success, I think it's overall a great series with lots of potential. It's just a shame we never got to see an evolution past San Francisco. You can't talk about Grand Theft Auto clones without mentioning Saints Row. The series started as an exclusive for the Xbox 360, and to this day, has never been made officially playable on the PC or PlayStation platforms. The first game was really something you could call a GTA clone. At this point, the sandbox gang game had already been done pretty well, so it wasn't entirely a new concept at this point. But Saints Row felt like something different. Stillwater at this time, oh, that's Stillwater with one L by the way, was located on a peninsula. It was extremely run down in some areas, especially around the southern half of the map, around Saints Row, and other nearby districts. You could customize your character to look however you want. The storylines for each gang were separate, and you could complete them in any order that you wanted. Each storyline had its own arc, and its own rewards for completing them. The activities and respect system was actually kind of great in my opinion. In order to start missions, you had to have enough respect. Now you break it down, and it's all about respect. Get enough of it, they're gonna back off, and we're gonna move right on in. The activities were also really damn fun, and there was a lot of gameplay there. You have activities like the infamous insurance fraud. Mayhem is great if you want to cause some chaos. There was a demolition derby you could compete in, and even escort missions. There are eight different levels for each of these activities at any given location. In a game with three stories, they managed to pack even more gameplay into Saints Row, with everything else that you could do. There's a bunch of stores dotted around the city too. Clothing stores, obviously, like Impressions, Branded, and Sloppy Seconds, as well as barbers to change your hairstyle and length. The car customization was great too, and the different clothing and hairstyle options, complete with the ability to, like I said, change the length of your hair, was pretty much brand new at this point. The player comes in all shapes and sizes, and he can look pretty much any way you wanted to, which made it much easier to have a character you could have as some kind of maniac self-insert. Saints Row released in 2006, some months after Driver Parallel Lines. And yet those two games feel worlds apart. Not to disparage Driver PL, I like that game a lot, but Saints Row had a lot of passion behind it, and it feels like it was the game Volition really wanted to make, despite being absolutely hilarious in its own right. So you're Julius's new boy, huh? You don't look like much. Then again, I don't look like I have an eight inch cock, so I guess we're both full of surprises. I'm gonna skull up that bitch. Hope you don't mind hepatitis. What? The story is still the most grounded entry so far. There are still a bunch of wacky things going on, so it's not taking itself too seriously. But when it comes down to it, there are still some really impactful parts of the story. And it's exceptionally well written in my opinion. It is a shame that it's locked to the one platform. 
Saints Row 2 perfected the formula and was a clear evolution of the first game in every way. It's still one of my favorite games of all time and one I play still to this day. Saints Row 2 released on Xbox 360, PS3 and PC in 2008 to great success. Being the first game in the series on the PlayStation and the PC, the game had to stand out on its own story-wise. And the beginning of the game in prison when the boss wakes up from their coma was a perfect excuse to have a clean slate for the rest of the game. This version of Stillwater had been considerably improved and expanded. Now located on a lake somewhere in Michigan, Stillwater had... That's Again, with one L by the way, Stillwater had been given a huge makeover from top to bottom. Even though it was the same location, it had changed so significantly that every street felt brand new. And for Xbox players, it was especially fun revisiting old districts and neighborhoods to see what had changed. Activities are back with some great additions, but unlike the first game, there are only six levels per activity. My favorite additions here were, of course, Septic Avenger. Also the Bodyguard one, I, can't, I think it was just called Bodyguard. And of course Fuzz, where you pretend to be a police officer for a TV show. There are also diversions such as paramedic and streaking and flashing people. That is, that's not a joke. All of these would earn you respect somehow, which you could use to start missions just like the first game. But this time around it was different because this time you were the leader of the saints. The customization from the first game was pretty much twice as good in every aspect, except for the fact that there were no more barbershops anywhere in the city. So if you wanted a, a new trim, even if you just wanted to change your hair color, you would have to go to the plastic surgeon of all places. You could even customize what cars the Saints drove and what they wore. The three storylines for each gang are back, but this time there's also the matter of Altor, the huge corporation responsible for the development of Saints Row and the surrounding areas. The new gangs have insanely fun and well-written storylines that just like the first game have some really impactful moments. This is where Saints Row really came into its own and found its voice, deciding to double down on the fun factor while delivering a story that the series hasn't even come close to in terms of heart and immersion. Following on from 2, Saints Row the 3rd was something brand new. In many respects, it couldn't reach the heights that Saints Row 2 had reached. Steelport was a huge change from Stillwater, 1L, and I don't really feel like it was for the better. I mean, sure, they couldn't have set a third game in the same city. It just wouldn't have worked. But Steelport was so bland compared to Stillwater, in my opinion. And there were considerably less memorable areas around the map. There also just wasn't much to explore. Saints Row 2 had interiors like the airport, the shopping mall, the pyramid, a hospital, the police station, and so many other buildings around the map. I can't think of many interiors Saints Row 3 had that you could explore during free roam that weren't stores. The city also just felt less varied than Stillwater. It was very dull, even with all the neon signs everywhere. It was still a fun game though, with a compelling story, but it did also begin the upward trend in the series of leaning towards the more comedic side. Again, all of the games are funny in their own right, but there was a clear shift for 3. The boss is still relatively serious though. We'll party once the work's done. I'll call you when I make another move against the Morningstar. And the game still did pretty well. There are a lot of missions in this game though that are just activities repackaged as missions. And that was apparent immediately in a good chunk of the early missions. This was something that I really didn't like, but the bespoke missions were always great. After dealing with the gangs, you get to take on Stag, which is another great storyline for the game. The customization was still pretty stellar, and it's still a game that I'll go back and play from time to time, because it really does hold up. Following a trend that Driver set in place, Volition decided that for Saints Row 4, they wanted to go in a completely different direction for their next entry. We all know what happened with Saints Row 4, even if you never played the series. We'd gone from games about a street gang to the same gang running the country when aliens attack and eventually destroy Earth. The series had taken a road that they really couldn't come back from. In my opinion though, and I don't know if this is gonna be a hot take, but I honestly really love this game for what it is. Looking at it objectively, it's a love letter to Saints Row's past. It's something that no other series could have pulled off. There were a lot of deep cuts to the series history, with many levels taking place in either locations from previous games or featuring characters from previous games. You could even hang out with virtual recreations of characters who had died, or even younger versions of your current crew. Of course, we can't forget about the superpowers, something very controversial in the fanbase. Originally intended as DLC for Saints Row the Third, it was later spun off into its own game, but I think that's where the problem lies. If the game had released as both a DLC and a standalone expansion for Saints Row the Third, I think it would have been A, much easier to market, and B, 
it would have left the door wide open for future games to pick and choose a direction based on what worked. If the alien end of the world stuff had worked out the way the other games did, and people wanted more, then they could have gone that direction. If it didn't work out as well, then they could have disregarded the story as non-canon and just for fun, and then continued the story further and take it in any direction they wanted. Unfortunately, 4 wasn't for everyone. Even though I have a lot of warm feelings for it, I can't say it was the right decision for the franchise. The rest of the franchise is easily forgotten. Gat Out of Hell was frankly an insane choice in my opinion, even if it did have its charm in some places. Agents of Mayhem flopped harder than maybe anyone expected it to, and the recent return to the franchise with 2022 Saints Row practically killed the franchise and its creator, Volition. It must be said that, at least from what I've heard, Deep Silver was the driving force behind some of the more egregious changes to the franchise. It wasn't the game that fans wanted, and it didn't really feel like the game the devs wanted to make either. Of course, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. I'm sure the teams put their heart and soul into the reboot because they wanted the franchise to succeed. But there are rumours that Volition really wanted to make a game more like 2 and 3 again. But as we found out, that unfortunately never came to pass. Now Volition is closed down, and the Saints Row IP is in the hands of Deep Silver where it will likely remain for some time. I don't expect that we're going to be hearing that much from the series anytime soon, and that's such a downer. Despite being the series most compared to GTA, it really stood out on its own and claimed its own identity. I think the most we can hope for in, say, the next 10 years would be a remaster of Saints Row 1 and 2 on a current generation platform, and even then I think that's wishful thinking. But I would like to see, at the very least, the work done by the late Mike Watson, also known as Idle Ninja, and the Saints Row community at large on the Saints Row 2 PC patch finally be completed at some point. I think that it's the least that should be done. The Just Cause series is one that I have some trouble calling a Grand Theft Auto clone but it appeases pretty much the same crowd. It's an open world sandbox game with guns and cars and missions, so there's definitely some overlap there. My main point is, it's another sandbox game that's competing pretty directly with the other games I'm mentioning here. I have very vague memories of Just Cause, but I remember the box art vividly. The series follows Rico Rodriguez, and the gameplay for the time was really something new, and it's a formula that the series has stuck with. But to be honest, it wasn't really as good as it was cracked up to be, leaving generally mixed reviews behind in its wake. It released in, oh look at that, 2006. And it probably shouldn't have got a sequel, but Just Cause 2 in 2010 was really where Avalanche Studios hit their stride, set in Panal, a huge map with tons to explore. And if you want to talk about over-the-top open-world games, you look to Just Cause 2 and its sequels. The set pieces were intense, and explosions were loud and many. You could grapple and parachute around to your heart's content. I played this game a lot when I was younger, but I never completed it, but I planned to eventually. Just Cause 3, which released in 2015, is where I spent most of my time in the series. I love everything about the sandbox experience in Just Cause 3. I love calling down a big stupid jet and tethering a bunch of cars to the back like a maniac, or sliding down the side of a mountain in a big boat like a maniac, or blowing up a bridge, you know, like a maniac. The grapple hook, along with everything that it can do, is what makes Just Cause unique. The addition of the wingsuit was the best decision they ever made, and it handled really well. That was until the addition of the jetpack wingsuit in one of the DLCs. Fully upgrading this thing turned Just Cause 3 into the best Iron Man simulator that money can buy. The fact that you can get it super early on in the game is a bonus too. It's my favourite way to liberate outposts, destroy chaos objects, and complete missions, and it's generally just a really great way to get around town. The Rebel Drop system allows you to call in different vehicles and weapons for you to use at your leisure, which only added to the sandbox experience. The game is pretty funny too, and features David Tennant on the radio. Everything is absolutely fabulous. It's not that every single major military base has been wiped off the map and that this regime is a cut hair away from complete and utter collapse. No! Super! Fantastic! Stupendous! When it came out on the consoles of the time, it didn't run that well. If you haven't played it, then it's really going to be worth your time in my opinion. I love that game. Going from town to town, outpost to outpost, liberating them from brutal dictatorship as a one-man army, it honestly never gets old. It's extremely satisfying, blowing up big chaos objects, and it makes you wonder why they ever thought this could run at a near-locked 30fps on console at the time. It's just beyond me. Just Cause 4 released in 2018 to favourable reviews, and it was clearly trying to be an evolution of 3. This time Rico finds himself in Solus, 
Solace? A South American country that is subject to a lot of extreme weather, such as thunderstorms and tornadoes. These will dynamically spawn into your games and you can interact with them in the sandbox. For me, Just Cause 4 felt like a downgrade though. The wingsuit handling felt so much worse than it did in 3, and you didn't have the jetpack from the first game. You had to buy another DLC just to get that functionality back. The worst part is that if you did, you'd find the wingsuit didn't control nearly as fluidly as it did in 3. And there also seemed to be less destructible objects. And there were no bridges that could be blown up. That was the biggest travesty. They did improve on the grapple hook though, as they had a lot more abilities, such as controllable rockets or balloons, among other things. The series just kind of went silent after 4. That is, until recently, as Square Enix recently said that they are working on a new entry in the series. This has gotten me hopeful for a return to form for the series, and hopefully they can innovate on the formula in a meaningful way to keep the series relevant. Most of all though, I just hope they give the teams enough time to make the game that they want to make, and enough resources to do just that. Grand Theft Auto 6 is, hopefully, coming out next year, and I don't know how long Just Cause 5 has been in development, but by rights it should have been around 2018-2019 when 4 released. Just Cause has a great opportunity to do what Saints Row did and position itself adjacent to Grand Theft Auto as a deceivingly similar game on the surface, while having a depth and nuance that only a game like Just Cause can have. Gameplay-wise, I mean. Here's hoping it works out. There's been a lot of games over the years that have tried their hand at the genre. I think one of the most famous examples is definitely The Simpsons Hit and Run. If you're around my age, this game may have been a big part of your childhood. Even as a kid who started playing GTA 3, very young, Hit and Run has such a great vibe and it was so incredibly faithful to the show. And it was fun to play. If there was ever a game more deserving of a remaster, I haven't heard of it. The world was filled with iconic locations from the show, each map had a ton of fun things to explore. It never got a sequel though, as The Simpsons game was the next big Simpsons game. I would love a modern version of the game though. Think of all the things they could do building off of everything The Simpsons has done since. I think it's about time. Watch Dogs couldn't be more recognisable in this category, and tried to mix an open world sandbox with a hacking game to mix success. Watch Dogs 2 was decent, but Legion was pretty forgettable. I'm honestly surprised the series has run this long. Watch Dogs 1 was a genuinely decent game. The driving was horrible, and the graphics downgrade controversy didn't really do its reputation that much good. And moving on to Legion, it was just a bland and forgettable game, with an interesting mechanic of letting you play as literally any NPC that you find on the street. But it made the game feel shallow, and there was no way you could identify with these characters. The True Crime series was pretty fun to me as a kid, and the gameplay is still going for that GTA-esque sandbox. The series was comprised of two games, True Crime New York, and True Crime Streets of LA. A third game began development and did in fact release, but under a new name, Sleeping Dogs. Another game that in my opinion is a gem, and definitely worth playing if you're able to play it. The series started in 2003 and is one of the earliest examples I can find of a true GTA clone. They certainly made their mark, Sleeping Dogs included, but once again it's just another dead franchise that shows no signs of return. The Mafia games, specifically Mafia 2, but to an extent Mafia 3, did a great job with their open worlds. Mafia 2 specifically is one of my favourite open world games. I love the 1940s vibe, the cars and the clothes, and when everything's covered in snow and the radio is playing literally anything, I get a pretty warm feeling. Even the 50s portion of the game has its own unique vibe, which completely changes the feel of the world halfway through the game. Mafia 2 is still a great example of taking the GTA formula and not worrying about doing a one-to-one -one creation, but taking the idea and running with it to create a believable open world that is fun to explore. The story is fantastic and the characters are wonderfully written and performed. The definitive edition of the game released either last year or the year before, or the year before that, I'm not quite sure, but it's definitely worth a playthrough. Mafia 3 fell victim to a lot of repetitive gameplay, and while the game looked beautiful, combat was satisfying and the driving was in my opinion really fun and well done. And even the story was decently engaging, but overall it just came down to that gameplay, which featured very similar missions and objectives from start to finish. If you like going around a map and taking out bad guys over and over and over again, with some unique missions here and there, then this game may be for you. I for one am partial to that kind of gameplay, to be honest, but it doesn't help the story and can definitely get very boring. I hope the Mafia series can come back sometime soon, as it's uniquely positioned to take on GTA, if they were able to do it right. Not to the same scale, of course. It will never outsell or jeopardize GTA's sales in any way. But it would be nice to have another big player in the space again, like Saints Row. 
Rockstar's own Red Dead Redemption games took the Grand Theft Auto formula and incorporated it into a Wild West setting. Cars may not have been there, but pretty much everything else is. The Red Dead series feels like the only set of games that can compete with GTA on the same level, but that's really only because Rockstar makes those games too, with all of the same resources that they use for GTA. So that brings me back to the question posed in the title of this video. Where have all the GTA clones gone? In light of a lot of live service games flooding the market now, a lot of them with open world elements or full open world maps, it seems that nobody is really interested in creating something new in this space to compete with Rockstar. I remember a time where there were sandbox games coming out left, right and center. Everybody tried to have a go with varying success. I remember a little game called Total Overdose. Can you guess when it came out? Wrong, it was actually a few months before 2006, but whatever. It's a game set in Mexico about a criminal turned DEA agent tasked with taking down the cartel. The game was actually pretty fun in places. It had a few elements borrowed from Max Payne 2, with a shoot dodge mechanic and bullet time, so it definitely felt unique compared to similar games. A sequel was in development, but it was scrapped, leaving the series as a one-off. The open world action adventure sandbox genre is my favorite video game genre. That's probably no surprise, but it's one that's looking pretty damn thin nowadays. When GTA 5 released, other games were barely reaching the levels of Grand Theft Auto 4, and some had already decided to go in a different direction. Now GTA 5 has been out for a while, and I'm afraid to say that not only are we seeing the same thing again, but there are less and less games in the genre coming out these days. The ones that do seem to be a buggy mess, or they're just not that good to begin with. These games can't reach the heights Grand Theft Auto V did back in 2013, and every year past is another year closer to GTA 6. We know this, and you better believe that every other studio and publisher is acutely aware of it too. When GTA 6 releases, I have no doubt that it will set a new precedent for how the open world sandbox should be done. That's going to be a big problem for anyone else working on a so-called GTA clone. What I think served Saints Row so well was the release of San Andreas two years prior, and Grand Theft Auto 4 was still two years in the future at this point. Saints Row had a big window where it could come in and leave its mark on the 360 players, as a true next generation open world, complete with ragdoll physics, full player customization, and everything else I mentioned. Thankfully it made enough of a mark to warrant a sequel. The driver games with three and parallel lines seemed to try and pivot to a GTA kind of style, and it didn't work out for them too well. I remember other games like The Getaway and The Getaway Black Monday, set in London of all places. And that was really fun, even if they weren't mind-blowing games. It was still something that felt kind of different to GTA. That kind of begs the question, do you even really want more games like GTA? Is this something that you, dear viewer, are interested in? They made three Watchdog games, for God's sake, and while they weren't awful, I'm really questioning if those are all just die-hard Watchdog fans, or people who really wanted to like the previous games and gave the new one a try because they really want another open world game. Saints Row's reboot was a return to anything but form, if you get my meaning. It felt like Saints Row in name only. With this new Just Cause game in development, I hope it can be the start of a comeback for the genre. GTA 6 will obviously steal the spotlight for some time before and after release, so I wouldn't expect anything in the realm too soon. Any game that's come out and try its hand has usually had some success with a game or two, but they just can't keep up the momentum for the follow-up entries. The bag seems to be fumbled at some point along the way. Is it even possible for a game to compete with modern Grand Theft Auto? The most compelling example of a GTA competitor right now is Red Dead Redemption's 1 and 2, and they provide basically all of the same gameplay, trading cars for horses. The early days felt like a free-for-all, but over time we've definitely lost something. All it would really take is a team of passionate developers that really want to take a crack at the genre, and a publisher that will give them the time and resources they need to create the game that they want to make. Unfortunately, that is just too much of an undertaking to actually happen in this day and age. These big video game companies don't want to take the chance risking their money on a game that may be forgotten a month after launch. All that money to create a brand new IP, to create a world capable of competing with a Grand Theft Auto, all in the hopes of maybe chipping a slice of the playbase. It's just not a worthy business investment. Maybe that's why Ubisoft keeps trying. They just want to keep making mediocre games, and you know, that's cool with me. I'm not going to buy them. So is that it? I mean, is Rockstar the only entity that has the resources to pull this off? Every studio had worked on RDR2 in some part, and the same will be true for GTA 6. Thousands of employees across the globe are working on this one game, and I don't see anything ever coming close, at least not for a while. The curse of Grand Theft Auto is that it's the best at what it does. 
and it's a league above everything else. So much so that Rockstar can literally do whatever they want. They aren't beholden to deadlines or current trends, they make the trends. So they can go any direction they want. I'm very much curious to hear what memories some of you have with so-called GTA clones. What are some memories that stick out for you? Is there something that you feel is underrated or forgotten in the long line of GTA clones? Are there any series that you think should make a return? Or do you think that we need a new IP to come in and stake a claim? But mostly I just love to hear about games that you love. Whatever the reason, GTA style games have fallen out of popularity, ignoring GTA itself. Not with the players, but with the people who make them, because nobody's really willing to put enough time into their games to flesh them out. These games release almost half-baked in a lot of scenarios. People stop buying them, and they'll go back to Grand Theft Auto, so the other games stop getting made. It's a bad cycle, and one I don't see breaking for a little while. Thank you so much for watching this video. If it's not obvious yet, I really miss the time where we had a bunch of options for GTA style games, and I really want that back. Thankfully GTA 6 will be out soon enough, and I know that's going to keep me going for years to come. If you enjoyed this video then please hit that like button as it helps the video get seen. I hope to see some discussion in the comments too, so I'll see you down there. But in the meantime, keep it breezy and take it sleazy. I'll see you in the next one.